Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. In the studio with us is David Pevsner and Victoria Rao. David Pevsner is one of those actors who can do anything. Huh. He's been on Broadway and Fiddler in the Roof. He's worked uh, across the country with national tours. He's done off-Broadway. He did rags. He's played every kind of doctor there is on soaps. Oh, yeah. yeah every kind of actor. You tell me I have a doctor face. <laughs> is that it? You have the doctor face? That's what they say. But the best thing in your bio was this kind of blurb about you're very good in musicals and nudity? <laughs> yeah, I just go right for it, huh? What is that? <laughs> well, no, um, uh, I think what it says in my bio is that I've I've just started, I've started writing songs, and I wrote some songs for this infamous little show here called Naked Boy Singing, which actually just closed here. And going to New York. It opened in New York, and it had just gotten the really nicest reviews, and it's doing very well there. But my joke about it was that I did a, um, I did a show called Party in New York City. I was in the original cast of that, which, you know, I had to be naked for. <laughs> and then doing a review like When Pigs Fly, which is what I'm doing here, and I also did in New York. I t sort of took those, my knowledge of both of those, put them together, wrote the songs and now they're in a show. So those are your songs at Naked Boy? Three of them are, yes. Were they your songs when it was playing here as yeah, well? Yeah. Did you uh, work in it? Did I, you I sing? Didn't, no, I wasn't. In, I feel like I've done my time being naked on stage. You know, let somebody else do it. But it was great. When I went uh, to pick up the flowers today over at the flower shop, Clifford Miller said, Oh, you're in your gym clothes. I said, well, we've got this guy who's got a wonderful <laughs> physique and uh, yeah, when yeah. pigs fly and he gets his clothes off. Not all of your clothes. No, no, right? not, not all, all the clothes. All. And he went, oh, no wonder you're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I've eschewed that behavior. But d does it create a, actually a problem seriously about keeping in shape? I mean, do you become obsessed by it? You know, it's not so much a problem, really. It's just it's, it's sort of part of the job. You know, it's part of the role in a sense. Um, and I think now that I'm a little, like, a little older, I don't get as obsessed about it. I, I feel like I can maintain it, and, um, you know, I don't want to be up there in a fig leaf and a paunch, you know, one I of the know. things I wear is a fig leaf. <laughs> so I do have to take care of myself, but... but maybe they wouldn't hire you if you had a paunch. Um, I think they would. I think it's not so much about <laughs> that. But, you know, it is. There's that little bit of vanity that makes you go, I, I do want to look good when I go out there. And you know what? But I've always, for the last 12 years, I've gone to the gym. I love it. So um. it's not like it's... You know, I'm suddenly all of a sudden getting manic and paranoid about it. But I just it, do it. But it is really pretty amazing, and I won't go on as, as soon as I say this. But when you see Good. the play, <laughs> when you see the play, and you walk out, you know, with your fig leaf or your little towel on, everyone in the audience just kind of goes, <gasps> "Does no. that? Do you hear it? Do you no, hear it you on know, stage?" <laughs> you know what it is for me? It's like I'm in Hollywood now. I go to the gym. There are eight thousand men there with like, you know. <laughs> fabulous body. So for me, it's just like, I can't, if I took it that seriously, I, I probably would fold. For me, it's just, I try to look as good as I can, and if it's not good enough, well, hopefully the rest of the performance makes up for it. You <laughs> That's know. right. How did you get started performing? Oh, God. Well, you know, as a kid, I used to um, imitate TV commercials and all of that, and I was always too scared to do anything about it. So I went through the, you know, high school theater and college theater and then came to New York. Um, I got an agent before I came to New York City and just started auditioning for stuff. Where did you go to school? Um, Carnegie Mellon University oh, in you Pittsburgh. Did. Andy Warhol School. Yes, that's true. That's in Pittsburgh. Right. Yeah, very yeah. good. Good school. Yeah, I, I, I can't say. Beautiful buildings. <laughs> it was. I can't say it was, it, it was the greatest time of my life because there was a lot of sort of um, university pressure put on you. And it, when you're dealing with something that's so... Um, emotional and personal, which is acting, you know, they could sometimes go in through the side door mm -hmm. and, and make you a little crazy. So um, I really feel that most of what I've learned and, and sort of my, my learning of the world, you know, just common sense, happened for me when I first came to New York City. Well, know. did your mother want you to be an actor? 
<laughs> well, I think... <laughs> From Carnegie Mellon, what no. she want you to be? A no, actually, <laughs> I'll tell you something. Before Carnegie, no. Before they were like, well, that's really sweet and cute and all that, but um, they wanted me to be a doctor, a lawyer. It's a Jewish family. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think it was... I went to the University of Michigan for one year and sort of took the, the requisite courses there. And in between, I did a season of summer stock, and it was my first professional summer stock. And after whatever show I did, um, I remember my folks coming backstage knowing that I was going to go to Carnegie Mellon, um, that I was going to switch to Carnegie Mellon to be in their theater program. And that's when they essentially said, look, we're your biggest fans. We support you in anything you do. And it's, it's, they've been, oh my God, incredibly supportive. But that's really a, a boost, isn't it? I mean, it just well, yeah. makes it work. Well, my parents are sort of cool because, you know, I, I did party in which I was naked and like, you know, <laughs> ask your mother, to see you? well, you know, like I told my mom, you know, you don't have to come. And finally she said, well, David, um, I'm going to come. It's just when you get naked, tell me, and then I'm going to leave. <laughs> well, she didn't, she, didn't quite, <laughs> she didn't do that. She went like, I told her what the cue was. And for the rest of the show, she did this. Did she? That's so she, cute. But she came, you know. That's so cute. And they were just here recently. They saw When Pigs Fly. Well, let, let's see When Pigs Fly. Oh. Let, tell us a little bit about your, we have a clip from it, but tell us about the, uh, tell us about the show. What well, is the, the show, show? It's such a wonderful show. Um, it ran in New York for two years, and now it's here doing very well. It's essentially the story of Howard Crabtree, who is this real costume designer, a brilliant, brilliant man, who was told in high school that he would do fabulous, over-the-top, creative oh, right. musical comedies by his guidance counselor, When Pigs Fly. Uh -huh. She, you know, tried like to put the kibosh. he'd never do it, right? He would never, <laughs> never do it. Never he do should it. do something practical. Oh, and I think it's, as I said <laughs> before, I think it's something that we all understand. And so this is sort of like the character of Howard Crabtree trying to put on this incredible over-the-top musical review at all expenses and all the kooky things that go wrong. And because he was such a brilliant costume designer, all of the numbers sort of have the... Uh, um, the central focus of the costume. Uh, you know, just amazing things happen. Shoes light up and dresses drop into incredibly beautiful <laughs> creations. And it is the most amazing, funny, smart show you're going to see in okay. such a little... And, and you're... Uh, oh, it's a, it's a review. It's a basically review. Basically pulled with, together. With this very light storyline of right. this guy essentially trying to realize his dreams. And so we have you in... Oh, this, this is a number called Not All Man. <laughs> Not All Man? Right. Okay. We'll see that. Okay. I want to blend in. I want to belong. But I can't fight the feeling that there's something wrong. Why do they say I'm not all man? I want to run wild and roll in the hay. But there's a little part of me that's saying they. Why do they say I'm not a man? I'm confused, but I'm not stupid. Back in school, I was head of the class. Still, it's hard to stay clear headed when you feel like a horse's ass. I got muscles to burn, a stubby physique. You must admit my silhouette is classic Greek. Why do they say I'm not a man? They can't say you're not a man. Oh. <laughs> See, the whole idea of that is it starts out behind a wall, and he, he sings about how he doesn't understand why the guys don't pay attention to him, and, you know, he, he sort of holds himself together, and he comes out from the wall, and he's a centaur. He's never looked behind <laughs> him. He doesn't know why this is happening. Who's behind you? Um, that's actually the Howard character. <laughs> And so in the next scene, he comes out and talks to the audience wearing the, the purple oh, bottoms of the pants. It's very clever. It's it, such a funny so show. So each thing kind of like works into the other. It does. It's a very intricately woven piece. You talked about being a writer. You wrote, you've written... Um, My little silly songs for naked songs, boys. But that are on stage. That's very I'm good. What very else do you write? Well, um, I've written a, a screenplay that um, actually I, I submitted to the Outfest screenwriting competition here. The Outfest is the, uh, the big gay and lesbian film festival and tied for third, which was sort of cool. Oh, good. So I'm on this journey now to get it to producers and, and um, directors and get it made. You know, it's a whole fa fantastic journey I've been on. Do you write parts for yourself when you yeah, do this? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, actually, in my second one, um, the first one I sort of geared very much towards like the theater people that I know. But in the second one, I sort of have more like, you know, film and TV people in mind for these roles because, you know, to get anything made, you really sort of have to 
have some names attached. Right. But there's that, and I've written a, a, a storybook for adults um, that's all written in rhyme. I've just, I've sort of touched on a lot of things, and I just really enjoy it. Do you think this will be your final no. goal? You oh, writing? Can, yeah. No. Um, you know, I have been acting for 17 years, and I intend to continue doing it. Um, I've done so much musical work in my life, but I've recently, over the last few years, started doing more plays and a little bit of TV, a little bit of film. So, you know, it's like there's just so much to do. Will you stay in uh, Los Angeles or, or New York? I think ideally, down the line, I'd like to be <coughs> bi-coastal. But for right now, you know, I feel like I'm in the absolute right place. I love having the show. Because I did it f in New York for two years, and I just loved being a part of it there. When you did it in New York, were you living in New York? I mean, yeah. was that your primary residence? That's where I, I had been. So, so are you just kind of camping out right now? I sort of am, you know. <laughs> Do you want to like, go back? <laughs> if you see me with my, with my bags, you know, walking down the street, you know, wave, say hi. David, come stay <laughs> with us. You know, I'm, I'm in no hurry to go back, you know. Um, a lot of what I want to do right now, project-wise, is out here. And as a writer, you know, you can write anywhere. That's um, but I'm, I'm, having, I'm having a good time out here. Good. And we want you to stay here. Well, thank you. We want you to stay and good luck in um, When Pigs Fly yes. and everything else. I know you're going to be, we're going to be seeing your face everywhere. Well, I hope so. so thank you. Thank you very much for being with nice us. Nice meeting you. Bye. Don't go away because we'll be right back with actress Victoria Rao. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with the great Victoria Rowell. Our director just looked at her and said, oh, let's go on for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria Rowell is not only an actress who's uh, had long, long careers in two great shows, one of them, uh, Diagnosis Murder, and the other one, the Young and the Restless. The Young and the Restless uh, CBS series was uh, Diagnosis Murder. But she's appeared in numerous films. She's received all kinds of honors, especially six Image Awards for the NAACP, which is such an honor, and writes and dances. But she also helps foster children. She lobbies for child welfare. Victoria, let's start out and ask you, did you study dance as a child? <laughs> yes, I did. I did know that. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I had my point she's on today, Joan. <laughs> um, They're very pointy. <laughs> <laughs> I studied uh, with the Cambridge School of Ballet in Massachusetts, and then I won a Ford Foundation scholarship there, and then went to American Ballet Theater on scholarship, and then continued with a professional dance career. So were, did you, you audition to win your scholarship? Is that what happened? Or how did you get to Cambridge? Well, I was, I was living in Maine, and I showed a great love of classical ballet. And just, 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 no one in your family? No nothing? one in my family. I just love ballet, especially. And so um, there was a relative in Massachusetts, Richard Armstead, who noticed a flyer going around for youth to study <laughs> classical ballet, specifically inner city youth. And we were, figure, we were trying to figure out how can we make this work. I was living on a 60-acre farm, <laughs> and I had to suddenly become an inner-city youth, but we made it work, and there I was, and it was fantastic. I stayed there for about uh, six or eight years in so Cambridge. Did you plan to be a professional dancer? Um, I guess so. It was all that I wanted to do. I didn't want to be a prima ballerina or even a principal oh. dancer. I just wanted to be in the core and travel and learn the ballets. Oh, and, really? Um, but I was singled out to do a lot of soloist work, and it was very rigorous. It wasn't, it's not a career I would necessarily recommend for my daughter, but it's something I got a lot of value out of. What about yeah. acting? Did you then take acting lessons? That was an accident. That was Another completely. accident? <laughs> <laughs> um, a series of good fortunes, I guess you could say. Um, I, was, I was invited to audition for commercials, modeling um, and then some commercials, and then Bill Cosby invited me to be on the show, and um, I, to audition, I should say, for the show. Where were you at this point, in New York? I was back in Boston. Oh, you're back I, in Boston. I had done my stint with American Ballet Theater, and I was back in Massachusetts teaching in Roxbury 
uh, inner city youth, teaching them classical ballet. Oh, you were. So, um, but then I got the calling to come to New York and audition, and uh, I finally landed a film with Bill Cosby, and then things continued to to roll along. So, can we say that's your lucky break? Yeah. Would it be? Yeah, yeah, I would have to say so. <laughs> Abs absolutely. <laughs> did you come to Los Angeles to live then? Um, I did the uh, I did the film with Bill, and then I w had a recurring role on his show, and then I got a wonderful audition request um, from Fred Silverman for ABC at the time uh, for a pilot, which didn't go, and then I was invited to audition for The Young and the Restless, which did go, and I stayed there for eight years. And how, can, how does it feel to stay in one place for eight years? Do you do other work at the same time, or what happens to your life? Um, I always <coughs> have done three things, at, at least three things at once. When I was a dancer, I sold vintage clothing on East 8th Street. I was an au pair. Oh, I you I were? Always, I, did many th I always have done many things. So when I was on The Young and the Restless, I was working with not only Eddie Murphy in a film, but I'd, I'd worked with Jim Carrey on a film, and I also got another series with Dick Van Dyke. So you were able to... D Break away? How do you do that? Well, see, you now, when actors say to me, okay, what are you doing? How come you're getting to do this other work? And I, I would say, I don't leave it to my manager necessarily oh. or my agent to negotiate the deal. I think it's very, it's imperative that the actor get involved in the negotiations. And I would do this and I would convince the producers on both sides that I would <coughs> be able to handle the workload. And so I did both Diagnosis, Murder, and Young and the Restless simultaneously for almost oh, six you did? years. Oh, you did them both? I just recently have taken a leave of absence from Young and the Restless. Oh, I didn't realize they were overlapping. Oh, yes. I would do the soap in the morning and then drive to the next set and do Diagnosis, Murder, well, and Well, are you afraid day. to work hard? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you no. have this great work ethic, don't you? I, yeah. Or maybe it's an art artistic ethic. I think to be a true artist, you have to be a hard worker. I, I agree with you. Yeah. And I think the idea of not dropping back and saying, I can only do one thing at a time. Oh, yeah. Forget that. Yeah. Forget that. And, you know, and I think, of course, a person's um, exposure to things uh, certainly enhances one's artistry. So, uh, so then you took a leave from one series and you stayed with the CBS series, which yes. you're doing now. Diagnosis Murder. <clears throat> which has um, gotten, you've gotten all kinds of nomi, uh, nominations, mm -hmm. Emmy nominations. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, the, the actual NAACP Image Awards were <laughs> awarded to me because of my daytime work. However, I've been nominated for Diagnosis Murder for the Emmys as well as for the NAACP, but it's more importantly... Oh, but is it a NAACP have to do with your acting or with your charity work? Um, always with my acting. Oh, it does? Always oh, with my I acting. They have the Image Awards, yes. Oh, I thought it was more with your foster uh, child plan. No, the, the NAAC Image Awards really um, applaud African-American artists uh, as they had not been in, in the not-so-recent past. Um, and it really is to to give them their their props for all of the hard work. Yes. Do you, what do you prefer? In entertainment. Doing? In entertainment. Uh, entertainment. Mm -hmm. What do you prefer? Movies, TV. Oh no, I don't have a preference. See, because you can do them both at the same time. <laughs> That's right. I don't have a preference. <laughs> what yeah. about stage? Have you done any stage work? You know, Joan, the, the, the stage that I've done has been classical ballet. And I tell you, the most intimidating thing I've ever done was double pirouette and point. <laughs> I, I don't have a big zest for doing theater. However, I, I think I'd like to try it. That's interesting yeah. because you feel so, you look like you feel, and I've been with you, you've, you're comfortable talking, and it seems like you would love the stage because it's like, Mm. Electric. It is electric. <laughs> it is electric. There's nothing like um, that energy between the audience and although you get into your own world when you're on stage, whether you're dancing or acting or what have you, any type of performance art, um, but that initial entrance onto stage is terrifying. Is it? Is it's it just like, terrifying. Yeah. So, but. What about writing? Um, I really uh, come to enjoy writing. I've always written, um, but I'm enjoying putting uh, some stories down on paper, and um, I really am, in, I am enjoying the results. Um, I've been invited 
by Viacom in the past to do a story, and I decided to hold off and do more of the writing myself. So um, oh. I'm working on a piece right so now. So you'll be writing something that has Victoria in it? Not necessarily. I don't write to star myself. <laughs> I really, I really have a wonderful story. Um, I may be in it, I may not be in it, but that's okay. I'm really a, about getting the message out and getting the piece performed. Uh, so I may not necessarily be in it. I will produce it. Well, how do you feel about living here as opposed to the East Coast? Mm. Well, I, I'm an East Coast gal. I know you are, and I've and just begun to go to Boston a little bit now. I've always been in New York, but Boston I'm just starting to know, and I think it's so fabulous. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> it's fabulous. Um, I'm really partial to the East Coast, growing up in Maine and then Massachusetts. I never envisioned myself being out here. I didn't drive a car. Oh, I forgot about that. And that was a problem. That. But actually, Massachusetts, <laughs> you don't have to drive problem. a car there. <laughs> Taxi, subway, it's a real did hub you? city. You can take the train everywhere. You don't need a you car. You did use all of you did. And I was in New York City. No one drives in New York no, City. No, that I know. But in Boston, I always feel like you could use a car. Well, I wasn't old enough to drive when I left. Oh, that's but when I went to New York, you know, you, you hail know. a cab right, everywhere. Right, right. And I came here, and I had, you know, a rude awakening. And so I learned to drive. And and now I drive a you 19 drive two cars. I drive a 1955 <laughs> Thunderbird. <laughs> <laughs> two cars at one time, so you well, get to three jobs at well, one time. Well, no, but let's um, talk about your foster children's positive plan. That's right. How did you choose that name, positive plan? Well, the work is positive, and uh, it is for foster children, and it's an uplifting title because there is so much um, negativity attached to foster care in light of the recent devastation. Um, there have been 10 deaths uh, in the last two months of foster children. So um, I chose this title because it's uplifting in a world that tends not to be so positive. Those uh, studies are really horrible to read. Mm -hmm. And it, the idea that you're working with foster homes, be it 1 or 10 or 15, um, gives that assurance, it gives me a type of assurance that those people at least are being watched over and other people around that group. It really does filter out. What do you do with that, uh, with your... With the foundation. Mm -hmm, your foundation. Um, well, the Rowell Foster Children's Positive Plan's primary <coughs> interests are placing foster children in art schools, fine art schools, uh, predominantly classical ballet because that's where I hail from as a, fo as a former foster child. And um, we have, uh, as a former foster child, yes, you were a foster in a foster home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, no wonder it's so close to you. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So you do know both sides of it, and being a dancer, probably made sense. It was <laughs> right. very anchoring for me. <laughs> ah. So. So go on. I'm sorry. No, that's I okay. Didn't know. Um, so we have uh, children in Massachusetts as well as here in California, and I get the various commissioners involved. And as much as uh, as much of the um, uh, uh, politicians who are involved, uh, Nancy Daly is very involved, and and Dick Reardon, and um, a number of people, so, uh, for former Senator Diane Watson. So and you've, so forth you've and so on. Uh, pulled in people from the city. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Los There's Angeles no other city. Way. Mayor, uh, Washington, D.C. That's what I thought you Absolutely. went back to lobby in Washington as well. Yes, uh, we, I've lobbied recently uh, with, I'm a national spokesperson for Casey Family Services, uh, for a new uh, proposal that the president has put forth to allocate millions of dollars over the next five years, about 170 million for emancipated foster youth. Which means? 18 years old, you're out on your tail. And so you, we this know. money goes to help the ones who are out? Who are out, because they have no oh, resources and no medical. What happens to them? They become homeless. And we Do have, they? right now we have 500,000 foster children in, in the system. And about 20,000 per year are emancipated. So they are our new homeless. They're calling it the new homeless, but we've been here all along. It's a horrible um, situation. Um, so that leads me to mention that I started a job initiative with Viacom Pictures to adopt 
former foster youth, emancipated foster youth, as production assistants on mm -hmm. their programs, and they've been they've really embraced the idea. And we have we have people on uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Lynx and Diagnosis Murder. I'm very proud of the program and really applaud companies like Viacom. It's so great, but it's also important that someone who has a connection can do it. I can go out and say I want to work for foster children, but I'll get doors closed in my face. Not necessarily, Joan. I mean, you know, <laughs> but you know what I mean? You have to really be on the inside. Like you said that some of the... Um, your shows are now being produced to be responsible to yes, youth. Yes. Tell us about that because I think that's uh, to be applauded. Right. Um, I pitched an idea to Diagnosis Murder uh, regarding foster care. And uh, because these major networks have a plethora of, of people and they really can get a message out there, um, I thought perhaps this would be a wonderful vehicle. And so Diagnosis Murder. Uh, the producers and writers agreed to uh, run a storyline within three episodes of uh, foster care uh, regarding a foster child and the effects mm -hmm. um, that foster care has on this child. And I was just, I was thrilled that they adopted the idea and that we're really putting it into action. But that's, that needs to be uh, a beginning point mm -hmm. for responsible television and responsible filmmaking because those are the, the problems that we need to address. I agree. How do you raise the funds? Because I know you're, besides <laughs> lobbying and putting all these people together, you're also doing fundraising. Well, people like you, Joan, come <laughs> to fundraisers like uh, Goddess for a Day, which I'm throwing. What is uh, the, say, what would that be? Well, Goddess for a Day is a day of beauty for women. I, I'll invite about 50 women into my backyard and they'll have paraffin and they'll have steam and, and uh, massage and 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 poetry then, and, and then they pay to come. They pay to come, and, and they money? it's B it's Y O B. Bring your own bathrobe, bring your own book, <laughs> bring your own bathing suit, and uh, they pay to come, and they spend an afternoon champagne brunch. Um, but that's a newer fundraiser that I'm but doing. But you've done big fundraisers. This is on a small, that, intimate level. That's right. Our bigger fundraisers recently, I did one with Nancy Wilson as our headliner. Uh, also, Maxine Waters, Congresswoman Maxine Waters came and spoke. And then the previous year, we had Wynton Marsalis. And so I go for oh. big names to come and perform so that we have a good draw. We also do a fundraiser every September uh, for our foundation in Massachusetts. Oh, so you go back and forth with this. Yeah, oh, yes. Well, Victoria, yes. I think you, you are a remarkable woman. I love to see someone with the energy that you have because you make me feel like I'm lagging behind. No, no, Joe, not you. <laughs> but no. I thank you for coming and thanks sure. for explaining all of this because when people start seeing and thinking about a way to help, this is a great way to help. Sure, the Raoul Foster Children's Positive Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 40th floor, Los Angeles, 917. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.